Hello and welcome back to Chapter 1, The Origins of Modern Art, Part 2. You'll notice I again, again that I have a citation for the content of the lecture, which is uh, taken from our textbook, The History of Modern Art, um, Chapter 1. And the reason I do this is so that you'll know where I got this material and also so that we'll all get in the habit of citing our sources um, when you're writing anything for this class. All right, so let's take a look at the modern artist. A notion that an artwork is fundamentally the expression of a particular artist's thoughts or desires seems obvious today. But this has not always been the case. The idea that Whistler put forth is rooted, like many sources of modernism, in the 18th century. Until the late 18th century, artists in the West, since the Renaissance, had understood their work as part of a tradition going back to classical antiquity. So pre-modern artists uh, were looking at neoclassicism and romanticism today. Though each artist was expected to contribute uniquely to this long tradition going back to ancient Greece, the practice of emulation remained central to any artist's training at this time. Young artists would learn to create by first copying works acknowledged as superior examples of their genre, style, or medium. Only after a student fully understood the work of earlier artists and was able to reproduce such examples faithfully could he or she go on to create new forms. But even then, new works were expected to contribute to established traditions. This was the method of training used at art academies throughout Western Europe from the 17th century through the 19th centuries. Artists achieved success by demonstrating their inventiveness within the tradition in which they worked. All right, we're going to take a look at the work of Jacques-Louis David. And uh, he's French, so I, I, you'll notice I'm not saying David, I'm saying David. Um, and this is called The Oath of the Horatii from 1784. And this is oil on canvas, but this time it's quite large. So it's 10 feet, 10 inches tall and 14 feet wide. And so if you think about this, this is not a painting that could fit comfortably into most people's homes, right? You're not going to have a wall that's that big. So this is a, a history painting and it's a very large painting. All right, neoclassical art, uh, David's The Oath of the Horatii from 1784. For instance, one of the consummate achievements of 18th century French academic art is Jacques-Louis David's neoclassical painting, The Oath of the Horatii. The subject is taken from classical sources and had been treated earlier by other painters. For his version, David emulates the crisp linearity, rich colors, and sculptural treatment of figures by earlier painters, such as Nicolas Poisson, relying on him for the clear geometrical arrangement, the bold pentagon holding old Horatio and his sons, and the oval grouping of despondent women on the right. David has radically compressed the clear, stage-like architectural setting in emulation of ancient relief sculpture. So he's looking at ancient relief sculpture from ancient Greece, and he is trying to make his painting look similar to that. Of course, David's treatment of the theme, as well as his rendering of figures in space, was heralded for its freshness and novelty at the time of its initial exhibition, in uh, 1785. At this time, however, novelty and originality were subsumed within the conventions of artistic tradition. So it was important that you follow tradition. What does it mean to be an artist from academic emulation toward romantic originality? The emphasis on emulation, which is copying something from the past, as opposed to novelty, began to lose ground toward the end of the 18th century when a new weight was given to artistic invention. Increasingly, invention was le linked with imagination, that is to say, with the artist's unique vision, a vision unconstrained by academic practice and freed from the pictorial conventions that had been obeyed since the Renaissance. 
This new attitude underlies the aesthetic interests of Romanticism. So when you think about Romanticism, you're thinking about this unique vision. Arising in the last years of the 18th century and exerting its influence well into the 19th, Romanticism exalted humanity's capacity for emotion. In music, literature, and the visual arts, Romanticism is typified by an insistence on subjectivity and novelty. Today, few would argue that art is simply the consequence of creative genius. Romantic artists and theorists, however, understood art to be the expression of an individual's will to create rather than a product of particular cultural as well as personal values. Genius for the Romantics was something possessed innately by the artist. It could not be learned or acquired. And of course, as students, I think we all understand that you can learn <laughs> and acquire art skills, but for the Romantics, it was like you were touched by genius or you weren't. To express genius then, the Romantic artist had to resist academic emulation and instead turn inward, making toward making pure imagination visible. And so here is um, a color print by uh, William Blake called Nebuchadnezzar. This is from 1795. And this is ink and watercolor on paper. And it's uh, 21 by 28 inches. And so it's a, a smaller work. And uh, okay, so William Blake, the British painter and printmaker William Blake typifies this approach to creativity. Producing prophetic books based in part on biblical texts, as well as on his own prognostications, Blake used his training as an engraver to illustrate his works with forceful, intensely emotional images. His depictions of familiar biblical personages, for example, momentarily evoke for the viewer conventional representations before spinning away from the familiar into a strange new pictorial realm. His rendering of Nebuchadnezzar shows the Babylonian king suffering the madness described in the book of Daniel in the Bible. The nudity and robust muscularity of the king might initially remind the viewer of the heroic Old Testament figures who people Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling, but the grimacing expression and distortions of the figure which emphasized the king's insanity as he did, quote, eat grass as oxen, quickly dispel thoughts of classical prototypes or quiet grandeur. Neoclassicism and Romanticism lay the foundation of modern art. With Jacques-Louis David and William Blake, we have represent representatives of the two dominant art styles in the late 18th century, Neoclassicism and Romanticism. Both of these styles, along with the growing influence of art criticism, the proliferation of public art exhibitions, and an expansion in the number of bourgeois or middle class patrons and collectors, helped to lay the foundations of modern art. David's neoclassicism carried into the 19th century an awareness of tradition along with a social conscience that enabled art to assume a place at the center of political as well as cultural life in Europe. Blake's Romanticism poured a different strain into the well from which modern art is drawn. With its insistence that originality is the mark of true genius, Romanticism demands of modern art an unceasing pursuit of novelty and renewal. We always want to see something new, something original. Neoclassicism's use of perspective. So we're going to talk a little bit about how both neoclassicism and romanticism challenge the traditions of art, of the academic um, art tradition at the time. Neoclassicism dominated the arts in Europe and America in the second half of the 18th century. So from uh, 1750 to the 1800, to 1800, in neoclassical art, a fundamental Renaissance visual tradition was seriously opposed for the first time. The use of perspective to govern the organization of pictorial space. What is perspective? So perspective refers to a system for representing three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface, 
creating the illusion of depth, the illusion of space. Artists since the Renaissance have used two main techniques for accomplishing this. One is linear perspective and the other is atmospheric perspective. Linear perspective suggests the recession of space through the use of real or implied lines called orthogonals, which seem to converge at a point in the distance. Neoclassical artists were fully wedded to the idea that the, a painting was an adaptation of classical relief sculpture. So we mentioned that before. They subordinated um, atmospheric effects. They emphasized linear contours. And they arranged their figures as a frieze across the picture plane and accentuated that plane by closing off pictorial depth through the use of devices like a solid wall, a back area of neutral color, or a shadow that you can't see through. So they're creating a much more shallow space in their pictures. All right, and so if we look at the Oath of the Horatii, you can see how he's doing this. There, it, it, There's a very kind of shallow space in which these figures are arranged in a frieze across the, the front of the picture plane, and we can't see that far back. There's a wall in the back that's um, confining the space. How did David's art challenge the use of perspective? The neoclassical artists continued to use perspective, but they shrank the space they created in paintings. They created figures in a narrow space rather than a deep pictorial space using the principles of perspective. So the result, as seen in the Oath of the Horatii, is an effective figures composed along a narrow stage behind a proscenium, figures that exist in space more by the illusion of sculptural modeling than by their location within the pictorial space that has been constructed according to the principles of perspective. So David is using more modeling to create the illusion of space rather than these, you know, lines of, of perspective, the orthogonals. And while these differences in the use of perspective don't seem like such a big deal to us, for artists at that time, they could be seen as earth shattering. So these, these changes for us maybe they don't seem like such a big deal but for them it was a big deal in fact it may be argued that david's manipulation of perspective was crucial in shaping the attitudes that led ultimately to 20th century abstract art over the course of the 19th century artists became more and more interested in creating flattened pictorial spaces leading to the desire to actually eliminate the illusion of three-dimensional space in the artwork of 20th century artists like Mondrian and de Stijl. How did Romantic artists challenge the way paint was traditionally applied to the canvas? The clearest formal distinction between neoclassical and Romantic painting in the 19th century may be seen in the approaches to plastic form and the techniques of applying paint. Romantic painters began to experiment with exp well, atmospheric colors not necessarily seen in nature, but more in our imaginations. Again, this use of color doesn't seem very extreme to our contemporary eyes, but for artists in this time period, the use of non-natural color was very experimental. The neoclassicists continued the Renaissance tradition uh, to glaze paintings to attain a uniform surface unmarred by the evidence of actual brushwork. So the neoclassicists wanted you to see a window on the world, right? You're looking at the painting, but you're seeing kind of through it into this three-dimensional space, and they don't want any, they don't want to remind you that this is a painting by leaving any brushwork, right? They want everything to be just perfectly smooth. But the Romantics were much more experimental, and sometimes they went back to these very impostoed surfaces, so we're, surfaces where you can really see a lot of detail um, and curves of the paint. Um, from uh, Baroque and Rococo painting. During the Romantic era, there developed an increasingly high regard for also for art, artist sketches. And these artist sketches were thought to capture the touch of the artist and communicate um, authentic emotion. Such attitudes were later crucial for much abstract painting in America and France following World War II. How did Romantic artists ch challenge the way paint was traditionally applied to the canvas? 
three ways the Romantic artists challenged the traditions of French academic painting. First, the way they applied paint to, their, to the canvas, what they call plastic form. They were experimental in building up areas of paint and manipulating the paint on the canvas. Second, Romantic painters began to experiment with atmospheric colors, not necessarily seen in nature, but in our imaginations. And these first two we're going to see um, influencing the work of the Expressionist and Impressionist paintings of the later 1800s. And the third way was the use of artist sketches, which were thought to convey the touch and authentic emotion of the artist much more clearly than a finished academic painting. Again, while it may be hard for us to see the significance of these sometimes subtle changes in the way artists applied paint to the canvas, the colors they used and the ways they um, used and made sketches, these shifts mark the beginnings of the move toward abstract art at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. How is the term plastic used in an art context? Plastic term used to describe a material that can be molded, sculpted, or carved. Also used to describe a flexible or sinuous shape. So you can think of plastic as meaning the way paint can be built up or manipulated on a canvas, or the way clay or marble can be formed into a three-dimensional sculpture. And again, I'm giving you the citation. This is from the glossary of your textbook. All right, so let's look at Theodore uh, Jericho, and this is uh, a, a horse devoured by a, a lion, and this is a lithograph, which is a printing process, and this is black lithographic ink on prepared stone paper. And again, it's 10 by 14, so a relatively small sketch. All right, printmaking and lithography. Printmaking likewise experienced a resurgent, eager to exploit the capacity of prints to produce multiple copies. Romantic artists sought techniques that would endow prints with the spontaneity of drawings. Prior to the invention of photography, the easiest way to reproduce images was through printmaking. Some artists were particularly drawn to this, often preferring the intimate scale and wide circulation afforded by prints, so you could make a lot of copies and sell them relatively inexpensively and really get your work out there to a lot of people who maybe couldn't afford a painting. Uh, Blake created experimental relief etchings to pursue this interest. Romantic artists also quickly embraced the new process of lithography in order to achieve their goals. Among the earliest uh, romantic artists to use this medium was uh, Jericho and his horse devour, devoured by a lion from 1820 uses lithography to explore a famous romantic theme, the nobility of animals in the face of unpitying nature. The immediacy of the lithogra lithographic line contributes to the subject's drama while Jericho's manipulation of tone delivers velvety black passages that recede ominously in the background framing the terrifying jaws of the lion. All right, and so we're moving on to the painting of Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang. And again, it looks like Ingres, the way you pronounce it, but you're gonna say Ang because it's French. And this is called the Grand Odalesque from uh, uh, 1814. This is oil on canvas, um, 36 feet, 36 inches tall, so about three feet tall, by 64 inches long. And again, this is a very you know famous painting. I'm sure you've um, seen it uh, before. And this is the one in which they say that he has so exaggerated the curve of her spine that it's almost like he added vertebrae um, to her. So while she is um, a natural form, um, he's really exaggerated uh, the characteristics of her um, of her body. All right, Jean Auguste Dominique Ang. Um, Ang uh, was a pupil of David, who during his long life remained the ex uh, exponent and defender of Davidian classical tradition. He exploited neoclassicism for its ability capacity to achieve cool formal effects and leaving political agitation to others. So for Ang, 
not interested in putting political content into his work. His style was essentially formed by 1800 and cannot be said to have changed radically in works painted at the end of his life. So he found his style. He kept that style pretty much throughout his whole uh, you know, mature career as a painter. Ang represented to an even greater degree than did David the influence of Renaissance classicism. He used a color palette that was brilliant and delicate, combining classical clarity with romantic sensuousness, often in liberated, even atonal harmonies of startling boldness. So if you look at his color palette, um, you'll see how, how bold it is. His grand odalesque, although not a figure from any specific historical or mythological text, retains the monumentality and idealization typical of history painting. So even though we don't you know, know who this woman is from a specific you know, historical event, um, it still looks like a history painting in its scale. Ang pushed his idealization of the female body to the limits of naturalism, offering abstractions of the models from which he worked. So he really uh, elongated and stretched their bodies as he painted. And here is one of his drawings. And if you look at this drawing carefully and you look at the quality of the line that Ang is using, um, the author of our textbook makes the, um, she says that if you look at this, you really see that the line becomes very abstract in the way that it curls around and circles in on itself. Um, so while the figures are not abstract, the quality of the of the line that he uses um, is, and this is graphite on white woven paper. This is very small, says seven by eight inches about. But again, we're, we're kind of studying the way that he's drawing. All right, uh, Ang's abstracted forms and drawings. If you look at Ang's drawings, you can see that the way he uses line approaches abstraction. So while his paintings clearly create the illusion of three-dimensional space, if you look at areas of his drawings and examine his use of line, elements of ab abstraction begin to appear. The textbook describes his line as, quote, coiling and uncoiling in self-perpetuating complications that seem as much autonomous as descriptive. In other words, the line takes on a life of its own. He, it, you know, Ang is drawing for the pure pleasure of drawing. And it's not just there to create an illusion of three-dimensional form. And just as artists in the future, like Edgar Degas and Pablo Picasso, studied Ang's drawings, they were inspired in their own artistic journey, um, Degas toward Impressionism and Picasso toward Cubism. As we look at these artists from the early 19th century, you can see that we're searching for the roots of modern art in their artistic methods and modes of production. So we're looking for the roots of modernism in these, in these works. All right, and speaking of the roots of modernism, this is Francisco de Goya y Lucientes. Uh, this is worse, and this is um, a plate. So this is another, it's an etching, um, a print, printing process. And it's from a series he did called The Disasters of War, in which he very graphically um, uh, documents uh, the horrors of the war that he saw around him. Francisco de Goya y Lucientes, one of the major figures of 18th and 19th century romantic history painting, who had a demonstrable influence on what occurred subsequently, was the Spaniard, um, and you can refer to him simply as Goya. In a long career, Goya carried his art through many stages, from penetrating portraits of the Spanish royal family to a particular concern in his middle and late periods with the human propensity for barbarity. The artist expressed this bleak vision in monstros monstrously fantastic scenes of human depravity. Like Jericho and, and Blake, he pursued printmaking, exploiting the relatively new medium of aquatent to endow his etchings with lush chiaroscuro effects. His brilliant cycle of prints, The Disasters of War, depicts the devastating results of Spain's popular uprising against Napoleon's uh, armies during the Peninsular War. So this is 1808 to 1814. And this is triggered by Napoleon's determination to control the ports of Portugal and Spain. So 
Napoleon just kept coming and both sides did a lot of really horrible things. Facing certain invasion, the Spanish monarchy agreed to an alliance with the French emperor who nevertheless gave his army free reign to pillage Spanish towns as they marched to Portugal. So even though the Spanish king let Napoleon come through, um, he's, Napoleon's troops still did um, really bad things. In one of the most searing indictments of war in the history of art, Goya described with reportorial vividness and personal outrage atrocities committed on both sides of the, con uh, the conflict. While sympathetic to the modern ideas espoused by the great thinkers of the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason, Goya was simultaneously preoccupied with the irrational side of human nature and its capacity for the most grotesque cruelty. Because of their inflammatory and ambivalent messages, his etchings were not published until 1863, which was well after the time that he died. During his lifetime, Goya was not very well known outside Spain, despite his final years um, when he lived in uh, the French city of Bordeaux. Once his work had been rediscovered by Manet in the mid-19th century, it made a strong impact on the mainstream of modern painting. And many art historians consider Goya as the first modern, <clears throat> modernist painter or, you know, the father of modernism, as his paintings reflect his personal views of human suffering. So uh, Goya wasn't painting these for anybody but himself. He was expressing his outrage at what he had seen um, in this war. And that's, um, you know, a very kind of modernist point of view. All right, let's move on to Eugene Delacroix. And this is, uh, again, uh, another painting called The Lion Hunt from 1861. This is oil on canvas, and it's about 30 by 38 inches, so kind of a medium-sized um, uh, painting. All right, Eugene Delacroix. The French Romantic movement really came into its own with Eugene Delacroix through his exploration of exotic themes, his accent on violent movement and intense emotion, and above all through his reassertion of Baroque color and emancipated brushwork. So he's really uh, using vivid colors and he's using this very um, kind of impasto, um, you know, looser brushwork. He brought the same qualities to more conventional subjects drawn from literature and history. Not surprisingly, Delacroix felt drawn to scenes taken from Shakespeare, whose characters often succumb to their passions for power or love. Delacroix's intense study of the nature and capabilities of color derived not only from the Baroque, but from his contact with contemporary at his time, uh, English painters such as John Constable, Richard Bonington, and um, J.M.W. Turner. His greatest originality, however, <clears throat> may lie less in the freedom and breadth of his touch than in the way he juxtaposed colors in blocks of mutually intensifying complementarity, such as vermilion and blue-green, or violet and gold, so, um, you know, orange and, and blue, violet and, and yellow, uh, purple and yellow, arranged in large sonorous chords, or sometimes small independent divided strokes, and you might be thinking this already, but these techniques and their effects had a profound influence on the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists, particularly Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh, and Cezanne. And we often talk about how uh, Van Gogh and Cezanne would lay down um, two complementary colors next to each other to make them pop. And so uh, they had studied the work of Delacroix. And so you can see how one artist influences the next, who influences the next, um, and so uh, to make these changes that we see.